Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I want to start, as always, with an update on the key statistics in relation to COVID-19. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 14,394 positive cases confirmed, which is an increase of 57 since yesterday. A total of 1,427 patients are in hospital with COVID-19. Uh, 1,005 of them have been confirmed as having the virus and 422 are suspected of having it. That represents a total increase of 119 from yesterday. However, the number of confirmed cases has declined by two. A total of 63 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, and that is an increase of four since yesterday. I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,354 patients who have tested positive have been able to leave hospital, and I wish all of them well. Unfortunately, though, I also have to report that in the past 24 hours, two deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having the virus, and that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2,105. Um, I should, of course, uh, inject some caution into uh, that figure. Uh, as I often say on a Monday, although deaths can now be registered at weekends, registration numbers are usually uh, relatively low then, and they can be especially low on a Sunday. That should be taken into account when considering uh, today's figure. Again, let me stress these numbers are not just statistics. Each one is an individual whose loss is a source of real sorrow and deep grief. And my condolences go to everyone who has lost a loved one to this virus. And let me also thank, as I always do, our health and care workers for the extraordinary work they continue to do in such difficult and challenging circumstances. Now, I have three things that I want to update on today. Uh, the first is that we have changed our guidance uh, on the symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, this is based on a recommendation from the chief medical officers across the UK. Until now, we have been asking people to stay at home for seven days if you have a high temperature or a persistent cough. That remains the case. However, we've also said that we are learning about this virus as it develops and we now have sufficient evidence to add an additional symptom which you should look out for. If you notice a loss of or change in your sense of taste or smell, something called anosmia, that is also or can also be a symptom of COVID-19. The chief medical officer will say more about this in a few moments, but to summarise, if you have a high temperature or a persistent cough, or if you notice a loss of taste or smell, uh, stay at home completely for seven days and don't leave your home at all. Uh, other people in your household should stay at home for 14 days. The second issue I want to uh, discuss today is uh, that from today, we are widening uh, the number of people who can be tested for COVID-19. Now, the Health Secretary will say a bit more in a moment about testing in care homes. The change I will talk about is that anyone over the age of five who has any of the three symptoms of COVID-19, including, of course, that loss of taste or smell, will now be able to book a test. Uh, the test will be available through the drive-in centres at Aberdeen, Edinburgh and Glasgow airports and in Perth and Inverness. They will also be available through the 12 mobile testing units, which are based across the country and which move around every five days or so. Tests at drive-in centres have already been made available to over 65s, to key workers, for example, people in vital infrastructure services and to anyone who needs to work uh, and who cannot work from home. Tests have also been available to household members of these groups. This further expansion that we are announcing today will ensure that anyone with symptoms will be able to find out if they have the virus and will therefore be able to know whether or not they should be isolating. Uh, tests can be booked online. Priority will be given to those who are key workers and these can be secured by booking through an employer. When you book a test, you will be allocated to the centre that is closest to your own postcode now, I know that for some people that will involve travelling at quite a distance. So we are currently working with the military to try to make mobile testing units as widely available as possible. It's also worth stressing, and I do want to stress this point, that for 
NHS and social care key workers or symptomatic household members of those workers, testing should still be accessed through the NHS. This testing ensures priority access and should be accessible to care and health service staff at NHS facilities within the local area. So that should not require people to travel long distances. Today's expansion is the result of cooperation between NHS Scotland, the Scottish Government and the UK Government. It will help more people to know if they have the virus and it will also be very helpful uh, as we build towards our strategy of test, trace, isolate and support. Something that, as you know, will be especially important as we start to emerge gradually from the lockdown. And that is relevant to the final issue I want to talk about today. I can confirm today that we will publish on Thursday a route map setting out our phased approach to easing lockdown measures. Uh, this will take account of the up-to-date estimates of the transmission rate or R number and the number of cases. It will also take account of the latest National Records of Scotland report due on Wednesday on the number of deaths from COVID. The route map we publish on Thursday will give a more detailed indication of the order in which we will carefully and gradually seek to lift current restrictions. Now, like other countries, we will not yet be able to put firm dates on all of the different phases because timings must be driven by data and evidence. It will also be important that we assess the impact of measures in one phase before moving on to another. Uh, we will continue, and again, I want to stress this, to take a cautious approach that ensures the virus is suppressed while seeking to restore as much normality as possible when it is safe to do so. However, Thursday's route map will confirm that, assuming that we see progress in suppressing the virus, the first phase will start from the next formal review date of the 28th of May. Within a few days of that, we will aim to allow, for example, more outdoor activity, such as being able to sit in the park, meet up outdoors with someone from another household, as long as you stay socially distanced, some limited outdoor sporting activities like golf and fishing, the opening of garden centres and recycling facilities, and the resumption of some outdoor work. This first phase will coincide with our ability to start, on a phase basis, a substantial test, trace and isolate operation to help us keep the virus under control as we start to ease up these restrictions. And that part is absolutely crucial. Thursday's route map will also set out our up-to-date assessment at that point of a phased return to school as guided by the considerations of the Education Recovery Group. And from Thursday onwards, we will also set out guidance for key industries on the changes they will need to make to ensure that they are employees and customers are safe in advance of further changes, uh, as well as setting out advice on travel and transport. So within two weeks, uh, my hope is that we will be taking some concrete steps on the journey back to a form of normality. As I've said before, it won't be normality exactly as we knew it because the virus will not have gone away, but it will be a journey to a better balance, I hope, than the one we have today. And as we take each step, uh, we must make sure the ground beneath us is as solid as possible. And that's why between now and then, sticking with the lockdown restrictions a bit longer to suppress the virus more is so important. Because that will mean we can start to take these steps with the confidence that we have alternative means of effectively keeping it under control. So for that reason, our key advice right now remains unchanged and it remains as important as ever. Please stay at home right now except for essential purposes, uh, such as essential work that can't be done at home, exercise or accessing essential items like food and medicine. You can, of course, now exercise more than once a day, but when you do leave the house, stay more than two metres away from other people and don't meet up with people from households other than yours at this stage. Uh, you should wear a face covering if you are in a shop or in public transport and please remember to wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. And finally, if you or someone else in your household has symptoms, then you should stay at home completely. And uh, a reminder, those symptoms from today are a high temperature or a persistent cough or a change or loss of smell or taste. By sticking with these restrictions now, we make it all the more likely that we can start that journey back to normality within the time scale that I talked about a moment ago. So let me end with my thanks again to all of you for doing 
the right thing and staying at home at this stage. You are helping to slow down the virus spread. You are helping to protect the NHS and undoubtedly you are saving lives. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to hand over uh, to the Chief Medical Officer to say uh, a few words, particularly about the change to guidance on symptoms uh, today. And then I'll hand over to the Health Secretary, who's going to uh, say a few words, including uh, some more detail on testing in care homes. Gregor. Thank you, First Minister. Today I want to say a little more about the change in the case definition and symptoms of COVID-19 that we are asking people to look out for. Since the beginning of the epidemic in the UK, researchers have been collating information from the first large group of people who tested positive for COVID-19. This has been used to determine the group of symptoms that are most likely to identify the most people who may have COVID-19. This analysis has confirmed that we should continue to use the symptoms of cough and fever that we already use. However, it's also confirmed now that there is sufficient confidence to add a new symptom too. Following a recommendation made by myself and my CMO colleagues elsewhere in the UK, the symptom of anosmia has now been added to the list of COVID-19 symptoms. Now, I realise that this will be a new term for most people. For the benefit of those who haven't heard of this before, anosmia is the loss of a normal sense of smell. And because smell and taste are so closely linked, it can also affect your sense of taste. In fact, this is how many people will first recognise it as a symptom. This loss of the sense of smell or taste has now been identified as a symptom that can be one of the earliest signs of COVID-19 infection. And so including it in the case definition may allow for slightly more possible cases of COVID-19 to be identified early on. The new definition of COVID-19 symptoms is, therefore, any one of the following symptoms. A new continuous cough or a fever or a loss of or a change in smell or taste. Adding the loss or change in smell or taste to the case definition will also slightly increase the number of possible cases which turn out not to be COVID-19. However, it's my view and that of my CMO colleagues that on balance, this is outweighed by the benefits of identifying more cases at an early stage. So I want to reiterate that everyone, including health and social care workers, should self-isolate if they develop a new continuous cough or a fever or a loss of or a change in the smell or taste. The individual's household should also self-isolate for 14 days as per the current guidelines. The individual should stay at home for seven days or longer if they still have a fever. And if an individual's symptoms worsen or if they don't go away after seven days, then they should call NHS 24 on 111 for further advice. As the First Minister has just outlined, there is an increased number of categories of people who are eligible for testing for COVID-19 under the UK Government Testing Scheme. This testing too should now be done on the basis of a new continuous cough or a fever or a loss of or a change in smell or taste. Guidance issued by Public Health Scotland will be updated to reflect this change and members of the public can continue to access further information on this through the NHS Inform website. Thank you very much. There are two areas I want to briefly touch on this morning. The first concerns care homes. Over the last few days, we have set out further additional steps and support for care homes in the face of COVID-19. We've been keeping all aspects of the support mechanisms under constant review to best protect both care home residents and care home staff. On testing, we have a clear position where anyone who was a COVID-19 patient in hospital should give two negative tests before being admitted to a care home. And we're also ensuring that all other new admissions to care homes are also being tested prior to admission. Should a care home have a case of COVID-19, we have put in place a regime where all residents and staff are tested subject to their consent. For care homes that have no current cases of COVID-19, the current position is sample surveillance of residents and staff again subject to their consent. But having taken clinical advice, I am taking a further step and will set out the detail to that in Parliament tomorrow. The further step is that we will now move to a position where all care home staff are offered, offered testing, regardless of symptoms and regardless of whether there is an ongoing outbreak in the care home where they work. 
This testing will have to be carried out on a repeating basis to be effective and will help us to protect residents and staff themselves. Frontline staff in both our uh, care sector and elsewhere deserve as much support as we can give them and that takes me to my second area. By agreement, we have managed to alleviate the cost of parking at three PFI hospital car parks for our staff. That arrangement was until the end of June. I'm pleased today to confirm that we have now reached agreement to extend that arrangement to the end of September 2020. What that does mean is that in a small way, we are able to alleviate some of the worry uh, and upset that's caused to our staff as they do so much to help protect all of us. Thank you very much, Health Secretary. Right, I will move straight to questions now. First question from Lisa Summers uh, from the BBC. First Minister, as you say, the key to easing lockdown measures is being able to wide, do widespread testing and tracing. Um, can I ask, obviously we're seeing some pilots ongoing at the moment in Scotland, but how low would levels of the virus have to be in the community before you can be confident that we can contact trace people uh, sufficiently and efficiently? And will we also have to adopt other measures, possibly like this app, for example, that's being uh, trialled now in England in order to do that in the long term? OK, thanks, Lisa. Um, just to take uh, these questions one by one, we want to get the, the number of new cases in the community as low as possible for a variety of reasons, but also uh, one of those reasons is that that then makes it uh, more uh, possible that we can effectively control uh, the virus through test, trace and isolate. But we're not setting a particular uh, figure on that. We also have said all along that we will need to have a test, trace, isolate system that is flexible enough to adapt. If uh, there is a sudden spike in transmission, we will need to make sure that we can respond to that. And we're building a system that has that flexibility and scalability uh, very much as part of it. Um, the Health Secretary reported yesterday that health boards already have 600 contact tracers ready to go. Uh, we intend that that workforce will be uh, 2,000 by the end of this month. But it's important to, to stress that they may not all be needed initially uh, if we have suppressed the virus uh, to a sufficiently low level. But should we see increases, more of them will be needed. So that scalability is really important. And obviously, we've got the, the trialling of uh, the, the digital tools that contract tracers will use underway in uh, a number of health boards from today. My last point on the app, uh, we're not building a system that is dependent on the app. And, and we have very deliberately uh, taken the decision to build a a bottom-up system that is based on traditional methods of contact tracing and uh, follow-up. And, and I think that is the sensible thing to do. Uh, but nor have we turned our face against the app. Obviously, it's still being trialled right now. I think the UK government still has some decisions to make about how it will develop in, in the weeks ahead. If we can be satisfied that that integrates sufficiently with our system and that you know, other concerns that people might have about any app of that nature have been addressed, then we will be very enthusiastic about it being a potential enhancement to the system that we have underway. But, but we don't think it is it, the sensible thing to do to, to make the system dependent on it. Um, we, we need to, to see it as an enhancement. And, and my very last point, of course, is that that app, the proximity tracing app that the UK government is developing, is separate to the, the digital technology that will underpin our more traditional system that contact tracers will use uh, to do the follow-up. So all of this has to hang together and those plans uh, in their different parts, but overall are at this stage progressing well. And I think, um, very, very final point, that you know, starting of the first phase of easing restrictions uh, towards the end of this month, coinciding with our ability to introduce a significant test trace isolate system is really important that we have those things in sync and that that's part of the careful planning that we're doing. Uh, Ewan Petrie from STV. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, I just wanted to pick up on the expansion to testing within care homes. Could you give us more detail on what the clinical advice was that has changed this policy and tell us why it's, it has taken so long to make this change, given there have been calls for this to happen for a number of weeks now? 
I'll ask the Health Secretary to say a bit more about that. So, I, I don't accept that it has taken so long. What we have done here is what we have done all along, is uh, gather the right clinical views, uh, making sure that uh, there is time for that and the evidence, and then taking the decision that is right at the time. And the evidence that I have relied on in order to make that decision is that the, the uh, route for the virus into a care home is primarily will be through those who work in the care home um, because they will be the people going in and out most from the community, bearing in mind that visiting with one or two exceptions has been stopped in care homes that residents should be uh, being looked after in their own rooms uh, and that there will be very little uh, in and out traffic to a care home other than those who work there. And also remembering the other uh, restrictions and requirements we've put in place about uh, how linked homes uh, should not be transferring staff from one home to another. Uh, on that basis, it makes sense that even in a care home that does not have a case, that we uh, regularly test the staff who work in that care home so that if uh, a positive test comes back from one of them at any point, we are able to, A, they are able to stay off work and isolate according to the guidance, but uh, we are also able to ensure uh, that we are then even more alert to the prevalence of the virus for the residents. And we would take steps at that point to ensure that uh, residents uh, were then tested, provided they consented uh, to that. So that's the position that we have now reached. It is based soundly uh, on uh, the advice that I've been given, and we will set out the detail of that uh, tomorrow when I make a statement to Parliament. The final point, just to add, which I, I think it's always really important to make when we're talking about testing, because testing is important, but we always have to remember and remind ourselves that testing is not a substitute for infection prevention and control. So, uh, you know, all of these measures that care homes are being asked to implement and have been asked for uh, some time to implement remain very important. And one of the reasons for that is that while, as I have said, testing is important, we do know that uh, testing of asymptomatic people, people who are not displaying the kind of symptoms that we've spoken about today, the testing may not be as reliable um, in those people as it will be in people with symptoms. So we must never see testing as some kind of fail-safe that then means we don't have to do all of the other things. And I think it's always really important to underline and stress that point. Uh, James Matthews from Sky. Thanks very much, First Minister. I want to ask a question about the Nike conference in Edinburgh in late February in the aftermath of that. We learnt at the weekend that a number of local people in Edinburgh and Glasgow suffered symptoms of the coronavirus. They were not contact traced. They learnt about the outbreak at Nike uh, through the media like everybody else. Did you fail in your duty of care to them? And did you fail in your effort to suppress the virus following the Nike conference? Um, no, I uh, don't believe either of those things is the case. I, I won't rehearse all of the, the issues around patient confidentiality here, the, the reasons why uh, that was uh, so important. There were a very small number of people from Scotland at that event. And as we reported, and all of these cases were reported through uh, our figures in, in the normal way, and I think it's important to, to, to stress that, but had we said, you know, patient X and, and Y health board uh, got it at a particular event because they may have been the only person in that health board to be at the event, we would have effectively been uh, identifying them. So that's why patient confidentiality, and it's not, it's not something that was applied to this, it is an important consideration in all of these things. But the second point is contact tracing was done uh, rigorously in uh, this situation. An incident management team was set up to make sure that protection of public health uh, was absolutely at the centre of how this uh, was managed. And 
contacts were identified and traced. Now, it is for uh, the judgment we've talked here before. I've talked in different contexts about the definitions of a contact, um, and it is for those contact tracers who are doing that to ensure that from the information they are giving, they appropriately follow up uh, contacts. Now, that process uh, was gone through in that case, as it would be in any other similar situation. Uh, Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Uh, First Minister, um, uh, we see again from the official figures that are relatively few people in Dumfries and Galloway and in the Scottish borders, either in hospital or uh, in intensive care. Uh, in both cases, in intensive care, it's it's below five. So uh, there's just an asterisk in, in statistics. On your um, route map ahead, will that allow for the possibility of uh, different restrictions being uh, raised at different times in different parts of Scotland, including the south of Scotland? Or might that present you with problems and have you therefore potentially ruled that out? I think I've, I've said to you before um, that, uh, and this should not be heard as somehow trying to avoid the question because it's not. We, we haven't ruled anything out but equally, we're not at a stage where we are saying, yes, we're going to take a regionally different approach. Because, as I, I think I said to you uh, in response to a question last week, we, we have to be cautious when we are uh, looking at the data in uh, areas that are smaller than Scotland overall, the uncertainties around that data become uh, greater. But I, you know, at a very uh, basic level, I have never ruled out anything that could be helpful in trying to suppress this virus. But what I hope we will see over the next few weeks is that we begin a, a journey and take a, a, a journey phase by phase for the whole country where we start to come out of this lockdown in a Yes, a, a phased and gradual and careful way, but also a, a steady uh, way. And I, I hope that will be the case for the whole country. It is dependent on us continuing to keep uh, suppressing the virus. Uh, and as we go into the first phase of that, it will become dependent on us being able to keep the virus suppressed through test, trace and isolate. And there will continue to be a need for all of us to follow safe social distancing and uh, do things that we're not or haven't been until uh, this epidemic used to doing in our everyday life. So I want the whole country to be able to uh, move back to a semblance of normality as quickly as possible. But we will never rule out anything uh, that can lead to a more effective uh, approach in, in different parts of the country if the evidence says that is both uh, necessary and viable and that it doesn't have unintended consequences along the way. Uh, Fraser Knight from Global. Thank you, First Minister. Um, as we add the, the new um, symptom to the list of people who have to self-isolate, we're no doubt going to see a lot more people having to stay at home. And as we move to the test trace, isolate support and people start to return to work, self-isolating and staying on sick pay really isn't sustainable for, for some families. So I'm just wondering when we do get to this point and people could be asked to self-isolate on numerous occasions, will the Scottish Government help to pay their wages so that they can, they can live sustainably? Uh, yes, look, we'll be looking at all of that. I, when we published the uh, Test Trace Isolate Support paper a couple of weeks ago, we uh, deliberately put a lot of focus on what that will mean for people uh, who have been asked to isolate, the practical considerations of that. That's why support has been added in there. Now, I'm not going into all of the detail of what that will look like right now, but we are considering all of these issues. I'll ask the Health Secretary to say a bit more about the, the sick pay issue because concerns have been raised around that, specifically in relation to care home workers who may uh, worry about getting tested in case they test positive and then have that uh, period of isolation when they, they don't uh, have the, the, the pay that they would otherwise have. Uh, a more general point I would make, as we, as we see the virus... Uh, become more and more suppressed in the community, uh, we should see a reduction in the number of people who have symptoms of coronavirus because there will hopefully be fewer people contracting the virus. Um, and the, the importance then of test, trace and isolate is it's one of the key tools we have to keep it suppressed. Um, but, you know, we, we should be, and this, you know, sort of uh, has a, a resonance with some of the the issues around our current use of testing as community prevalence reduces, as we hope and believe it is right now, then we will see fewer people with symptoms, uh, therefore, coming forward in that way. Uh, Jean, do you want to say a bit more about the sick pay? Thanks very much. Um, my starting point in this is that uh, I don't think 
that uh, a care home worker should be afraid to be tested because if they are positive and have to stay at home as we would want them to do, then the income they have every week reduces so significantly to only statutory sick pay. Now, there are, as you know, a number of providers inside our care home sector, local authority providers, third sector and independent sector providers, and private providers. The 3.3% uplift that I agreed payable from the 1st of April was in part to allow for the payment of the real living wage, but it was also to cover uh, that additional sick pay cost uh, for staff in the independent and third sector who, were, who had to be at home either because they were sick or because they were looking after or they were shielding or they were looking after someone who was shielding. Local authorities, of course, have their own clear terms and conditions that include uh, the payment of sick pay that is more than statutory sick pay. The final set of providers, of course, the private sector, are in effect small businesses. Now, my understanding is that some do have terms and conditions for their staff that allow for the proper payment of sick pay that is not the minimum statutory sick pay, but clearly others do not. So that is why I've said to the unions, uh, and to those providers through Scottish Care, I want you to come and discuss with me what you believe you can do to improve that situation and let me look at how Scottish Government can assist you in doing that. I'm very keen to have that discussion because I do not think any care worker should be in that very difficult position where they're trying to make that choice about doing the right thing for their own health and the care of their residents but knowing that the income that they will receive will reduce so significantly that it will be very difficult for them to manage. I hope in the course of this week, we can le reach a resolution on that with those business owners. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alan Smith from Bower. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, First Minister. Uh, Radio Forth joined radio stations across the UK today in marking the Mental Health Minute this morning at the start of Mental Health. Awareness Week. Now, as part of our Where's Your Head at campaign, one in three listeners have told us that they're feeling uh, anxious right now. They're suffering from anxiety right now. So I was just wondering what message you would send to those listeners and also for those who, who do need urgent help to see a specialist, what more has been done to, to ensure they can do that and to, to reduce those waiting times? Well, thank you uh, for that question. I think it is important that we all uh, mark Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, today is the, the start of that. Uh, my message to people, and I've articulated this message previously throughout the course of this epidemic, is that it's OK not to feel OK right now. I, I don't imagine there will be many uh, of us, if any of us, who've not had periods of feeling the pressure of uh, what we're dealing with right now. We've been asked to live our lives in a very unnatural way. We are uh, cut off from the normal human contacts that for, for so many of us, all of us, uh, are part of, of what gives us the, the quality of life we value so much. So it's a very, very difficult time. On top of that, many people will have uh, real anxieties about their employment, uh, their living standards. Uh, many people will be worrying about their children and other loved ones. So this is a difficult time, possibly the most difficult time any of us have ever lived through. So it is, it is understandable uh, and OK to at times struggle with that uh, and you're not on your own. Uh, there will be many people uh, every single day right now who are feeling similar uh, pressures and similar emotions. Uh, it's really important at all times, but particularly right now that we have support in place. We've announced uh, a number of initiatives over the last few weeks of additional support for helplines, uh, for dis distress brief interventions that give people access to mental health uh, counselling and wellbeing support. And we will continue to look at, at what more uh, we can do. Um, above all, though, uh, the, the most important thing um, is to find that route map and that path out of where we are right now back to something that is more like normality. And one of the things that I think is really important, there is understandably and rightly so much focus on getting the economy uh, moving again, uh, which is really important. And I want to see that happen as quickly as possible. But it is also really important that as we try to come out of this, we remember the human impacts and we remember the social interactions and family interactions that everybody is missing and that is leading to people feeling 
uh, more isolated and at times more lonely. And it is as important as we contemplate that route map that we look at these issues as it is that we look at how we get people back to work and children back to school. Um, I'll hand over to the Health Secretary who may want to say a bit more about that, but she also, of course, uh, recently announced some additional support for health and care workers who, for very understandable reasons, uh, will be struggling with their uh, mental health at this time. Thanks very much. I, w I want to echo what the First Minister has said. I don't think there will be a single one of us uh, through all of this period that has not at times felt overwhelmed, anxious, worried, and at points not quite seeing where this is all going to end up. Um, so I completely understand how people can feel like that and what they might want to do. I think the other thing that has happened during this period is that many of us have come to understand what matters most, and that human contact is one of the most important things that we perhaps took for granted and now notice by its absence. Uh, I want to say two things. There is a lot of information available on NHS Inform website. Uh, we've spoken about some of the tools and the support that is available there for all of us. Uh, the Clear Your Head campaign is specifically designed to uh, help us all take a bit of breathing space, short or long, to just clear our heads and then come back to whatever it is we have to deal with. And we will be doing more on that particular piece of work in the coming days. And the second final point I want to make is the specific work that we have uh, put in for su as support for our health and social care workers, who in addition to how all of us might be feeling, are dealing with situations that they have perhaps never confronted before or have not confronted to the intensity and with the pace that they are having to deal with it now. So that additional support of psychological services, of coaching, of counselling services is really important to them. And again, uh, we've made it available where you can uh, access that, uh, but very happy to repeat that again after today's briefing so that everyone knows where all that support is there for them to help us uh, work our way through uh, everything we have still to do. Okay, thank you. Um, Neil Puran from PA. Thanks, First Minister. Um, the police have spoken to the author, Neil Gaiman, after he decided to travel to the island of Skye during the lockdown. I was just wondering what your message would be to him or to anyone else who maybe feels like they uh, want to isolate in uh, the more rural parts of Scotland. Uh, well, obviously, it's for the police to uh, decide uh, what actions they take in these circumstances. And, you know, it seems to me uh, right that the police uh, had that conversation. Uh, with him. I, I don't want to personalise my comments here, so I'll make them uh, general. People should obey the rules right now because they're in place for a purpose. They're in place to protect public health and they're in place to protect all of us and to try to suppress this virus in uh, the way that we need to in order to start that journey back to some kind of normality. And I remember at the very outset of this outbreak making this point that people uh, might think that they are uh, running uh, from danger to remote uh, parts of Scotland, to the Highlands, that you know there's not many people there, so it's somehow safer. But you could be taking the virus with you, and of course you will be putting uh, additional pressure on public services and infrastructure in these rural parts of our country that are already under pressure. So do not do it. Uh, we've been very clear about that. You should not be travelling away from your home apart from in the essential uh, circumstances that we cover here on a, a daily basis. So that's my message to Neil Gaiman and it's my message to everybody. That the more we stick with this right now, the sooner we will get to the point I spoke about earlier where we start to take these concrete steps back to normality. But every time we have people breaching the rules, we risk a resurgence of the virus, we provide it with bridges to, to travel over, and therefore the risk we are taking is not just that we're putting more uh, people's lives on the line, but we are actually delaying the point at which we get out of the situation we're in just now. So it's not worth it, in my view, um, to do these things, but even more importantly, you are uh, breaking the rules and in some circumstances breaking the law. So please uh, don't do it. Severin Carell from The Guardian.
afternoon, first, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, the Scottish Human Rights Commission has just released a letter that they sent to the Justice Committee of the Euro uh, Scottish Parliament raising what they say are serious concerns about repeated breaches of the human rights of prison inmates during the coronavirus crisis. They also say in the letter that they've been in contact with the Justice Secretary on numerous occasions about this, and they're clearly dissatisfied. Um, can you give assurances that the human rights of prison inmates are being safeguarded in the Scottish Prison Service? Um, yes, I, I will give that assurance that that is an absolutely uh, key priority for us at every step of the way. Uh, making sure that we respect and protect human rights generally uh, as we take the actions that we've required to take and as we come out of this lockdown is important, but clearly people living in a prison environment, uh, for people living in a prison environment, that is even more important. I, I've not seen the letter, forgive me, Seb, but I'll certainly look uh, carefully at that. The Justice Secretary has set out uh, on a number of occasions the steps that are being taken in prisons, including, uh, regrettably, because we didn't want to be in this position, the early release of some prisoners in order uh, to uh, get a, a situation in prisons where uh, there is not overcrowding and we can start hopefully to rele uh, release and relieve some of the measures that have had to be put in place uh, in prisons, which have uh, led to a differing regime for prisoners than that they would be uh, used to normally. So I, I can't stress enough at, at the best of times, but particularly in these times, that human rights uh, for people in our prisons is are very important and we will always seek to operate in a way that respects and protects that. But once we've seen the letter, we'll be able to respond in more detail to the specific points that are raised in it. Uh, Vivian Aitken from The Daily Record. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, can I talk to you about testing today? Um, I've been speaking to a woman this morning who was tested while she did have symptoms of coronavirus and the test came back negative. Um, she continued to feel unwell and spoke to her GP who said, yeah, it does look like you've got it. It's an, a negative test. And he told her that tests were about only 70% accurate, and that's for people who were symptomatic. Um, she ended up um, in hospital, and the consultant there also said, yes, it could be that um, you had the virus. And he again said, these tests are not accurate. Um, just really wondered if you could tell me what percentage of inaccuracy there actually are in these tests. And also um, the woman tells me that when she did the test at the UK testing station at Glasgow airport, she had to do it herself and it felt different to her doing it herself than it did for a nurse doing it. So are there different levels of testing um, in currently in operation at the moment? Okay, I'm going to hand over to the chief medical officer to say a bit more, I covered this uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think, in terms of the reliability, the sensitivity and specificity of, of the test. Um, we've always said that in certain circumstances, the test will be less reliable and talk particularly about asymptomatic people. I think uh, Gregor has said before that the reliability of the test for people with symptoms is much uh, higher than that. In terms of the, the method of testing, as I've said before, it's, it's quite an intrusive and invasive test. It's not, uh, many people will have seen pictures on television of it being done. Uh, there are uh, trials and have been trials of home testing kits, uh, which I think in the fullness of time we would like to see uh, used more. Uh, but there are issues around uh, the fact that it is perhaps not always the easiest test uh, to undertake. So these are all factors that we need to take into account as we continue to develop our approach to testing. But I'll hand over to Gregor to say a bit more about the reliability, particularly in symptomatic cases. So what I'm about to say here is really confined to those people who have already developed symptoms. And um, like any test um, it, that, that we use, it has to be subject to a kind of quality assurance process. It's really important that actually clinicians, when they ask for a test, they can be confident that that test is going to be able to provide them with information that allows them to then base their decisions on. And that we know from the quality assurance process that surrounds this test in Scotland, that the sensitivity of this test, i.e. will it detect a high proportion of people who have the symptoms, who actually have COVID-19, is over 90%. In fact, it's over 91%. That's a really high sensitivity for this type of PCR test. The second aspect that we look at for is the specificity 
And what we mean by that is if we get a positive test on this test, does it mean to say that this person will actually have COVID or could it be that it's a positive test to something else? And then again, with this test, the PCR test that we use, it's 100% spe specific to the COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2. So that leaves us with a test that we should have real confidence in in Scotland. And I'm not sure where the figures that you quoted have come from, but what we know from the quality assurance process that sits around this is, is that the sensitivity is over 91% and the specificity is 100% for this test. Okay, thank you, Gregor. Um, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Hi, First Minister. Um, when, uh, I just want to ask about uh, any change in the messaging around the um, easing of the lockdown restrictions next week. Obviously, we saw the change in the messaging last week down south, um, which you expressed your disapproval of. I just wondered, are you planning to, if not drop, at least sort of make the stay-at-home messaging more nuanced? Um, are you planning to introduce a new slogan, if not stay alert, uh, what will it be? Um, right now, the message and the slogan is stay at home, um, apart from the essential uh, purposes that we know about as we uh, move into easing these restrictions, those essential uh, purposes for being away from home uh, may uh, increase, they will increase, but the default message is still uh, stay at home uh, now stay at home apart from these limited uh, reasons and in future it will be to stay at home as much as possible even uh, if these reasons expand. You know there may well become a point in the evolution of this that we decide to change that messaging but that is not now because I think the clarity of the stay at home message is really important and I, I think it is important that we continue to communicate that uh, very directly to people. So that's the default position right now, stay at home um, for the limited reasons that you know about right now. It may be that those reasons expand over the next few weeks, but still uh, that default message will be stay at home. Rachel, sorry. But doesn't it come rather confusing if you're doing stay at home while you can go out and meet somebody while social distancing, while being able to go to garden centres and all these other things? Doesn't that become more confusing? Yeah, so, so, so the point is... is a reasonable one, and that's that's what we will judge as we go. At, at what point do we move to something that is is more nuanced than that? But I don't, it's really important in this that we we stay as clear as we possibly can. And I don't want to get ahead of ourselves in messaging so that people are thinking about what a message might be in six weeks' time as opposed to what it is now. And what it is now is stay at home. And as and when that changes, I will stand here uh, and set out the changes and what that mean and the reasons that we're making those changes. But for now, the message is as it has been. And it's really important. I, I keep coming back to this point, but it is, it is probably the most important one to make. What, um, what will delay us getting to that later stage is people easing up too early. That's what will set us back. So, you know, that is why it's so important that I continue to stress the message as it is right now, because if we don't stick with the message as it is right now, we won't get to move on to another one at some later stage. Uh, Rachel Watson from the Daily Mail. First Minister, can I just go back to the Nike outbreak um, and on the point of concerns from people who think they might have contracted it from people who were at the conference? You and Jean Freeman yesterday have both effectively said that contact tracing might not have been carried out effectively because these people didn't tell contact tracers everywhere they'd been or everyone that they met with. Does that not judge why this should have been made public in the first point so that while the virus was still relatively low in Scotland, people would have been aware of the fact that you know this had spread from one person to quite a large number of attendees? And also, why did it take a week before mass gatherings were banned, given that you knew that this had spread quite effectively in the group of people? Um, firstly, I, I think you're putting words into my mouth that I didn't utter. I, I didn't say that uh, individuals hadn't told contact tracers. What I said was that it's for contact tracers using the standard definitions of contact to decide then, based on the information they're given, who requires to be followed up. And, and that, you know, as we go into test trace isolate, that process will be uh, really important. It's not every single person 
that somebody with the virus uh, comes into fleeting contact with that will be followed up. There are definitions around contacts, but I, I don't want uh, I don't want words to be put in my mouth that I I didn't choose uh, to use. Um, in terms of the the decisions around. Uh, public uh, notification. I've, you know, I've on a number of occasions now set that out uh, at a point when numbers of cases are very low and at a point when uh, we have an event that very, very few people were at. The issues around patient confidentiality are really important and I've set that out. And, and for people, you know, I would simply ask people what, what on earth would have been the motive for not putting more information into the public domain should it have been possible to do so. That, you know, we were all trying to deal as best we could uh, with a, a virus. So I would just caution people, uh, you know, sort of uh, latching on to uh, emotive phrases like covering things up. Why would we have been uh, doing any of that? We took decisions based on the, the normal uh, protocols around uh, public notification uh, and patient confidentiality that applies uh, to these things. And, you know, I set out uh, clearly at the time uh, the reasons around our decisions on mass gatherings. Um, we took a decision on mass gatherings ahead of elsewhere in the UK and the reasons we uh, took that decision were set out at uh, the time. Uh, Chris Musson from The Sun. Um, you have pledged to test all care home staff. Um, it's come after weeks of calls for this very measure and weeks of unused testing capacity indeed. Um, the GMB union today suggested you've been fiddling while the care home sector burns. So how, how would you respond to this? Um, I just don't think that is uh, remotely the case. We have taken uh, a number of steps to uh, deal with the situation in care homes. The uh, steps have been driven by you know, clinical advice at times, by expert advice, by the judgment that uh, myself and, and the health secretary have to take. And we will continue uh, to take all appropriate steps to deal uh, with the situation in, in care homes as we do uh, to take all appropriate steps to deal with the transmission of the virus in the community. And you know, we will face scrutiny for that rightly uh, and understandably so, but nobody should be in any doubt um, about the priority and the urgency we attach uh, to uh, making sure that there is appropriate infection prevention and control in care homes and the other tools that we have at our disposal, including testing, are used effectively. And that's what we will continue to focus on. Uh, Derek Keeley from The Courier. Thank you, First Minister. The Preston Journal has reported this morning on the deaths of multiple residents at Kirkton Court Care Home in Peterhead from COVID-19. The operator of that care home has refused to make public how many people have died from the virus at their facility. All we know for sure is that we're talking about more than one, but we've no idea if it could be significantly higher than that. Given the scale of the issues we've seen at care homes across the country, what steps can the government take to make sure providers are as transparent as possible with their local communities? And just a point of clarity as well, if I can, um, you said there have been 14,394 total confirmed cases as of today. But that's actually lower than the numbers released over the past two days. And I think it's 200 fewer than we'd expect with an increase of 57. Um, is there any reason for that? Um, on that last point, let me uh, double check uh, the figures. Uh, and, you know, I, I take uh, your word for, for what you're saying there. Uh, just to double check, I haven't uh, mistakenly transposed a figure or anything. So if it's all right, we'll come back to you on that point. But we should obviously see the figures uh, you know, reflect the, the increase uh, from the day before. And if today's don't do that, then it, it may be that there's just an error there. But I would need to, to check on that. On the uh, more substantive point about uh, care homes, obviously local public health teams are working with care homes. And we will certainly, in the specific case that you uh, refer to, uh, make sure that the, the issues of reporting and transparency are part of the uh, the work that's been taken forward. But uh, care home deaths are reported through the National Records for Scotland uh, figures that are published every week. Um, and the next uh, report, as I said earlier on, is due on, on Wednesday. Of course, that gives the, the total uh, number of, of deaths in care homes. Uh, but we'll take uh, both those points uh, away and come back to you on the detail, unless there's anything you want to raise now, uh, Jean. No, we will look at uh, this this afternoon, and um, if there's more information that we can give you, we, we will give that to you, uh, and we will also be looking at the engagement of 
uh, both the care inspectorate, but also that locally led, nurse director led team that I announced yesterday and the work that they will have, I'm sure, uh, begun with that particular care home. I know the figures, if I have mistakenly transposed a figure here and it's, I've given you the wrong figure, I, when we publish online in about half an hour, we'll make sure that that is clarified because I know that many people who watch this briefing uh, every day uh, pay very close attention to, to those figures. Uh, Tom Martin from The Express. Hi, thank you for this, um, Just going back to this issue of um, care home testing, obviously the, the move to uh, staff will be welcome, but why are we not yet moving to all residents? And um, the Conservatives, for example, saying this is this this move will fall short of what's actually required. And also, we seem to be about three weeks behind an announcement from Matt, Matt Hancock giving people the right to testing in these situations south of the border. Why, why are we so behind? And what? How do you respond to this issue? It's still falling short of what's required. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't subscribe to that view. We all um, and. You know, I've said previously before, I, I make no comment on decisions other governments are taking or make any criticism uh, of uh, decisions other governments are, are taking. We are all taking the decisions that we think are right and appropriate in our circumstances based on the best evidence. And, and I will uh, you know, absolutely accept the scrutiny of the decisions uh, we are taking and answer the, uh, the, the points made and the reasons why we're, we're taking certain decisions. On care homes in particular, we uh, have set out previously the... Uh, this is about trying to uh, do as much as it is possible to do to stop the infection getting into care homes uh, where uh, it is not there. Now, that means looking at uh, where the infection or, or from what source the infection is likely to get into care homes. Now, we've covered previously the testing of residents go being admitted to care homes. Uh, we have very limited visiting in care homes right now. Um, and therefore, one of the other potential sources, through absolutely no fault of theirs, I should say, are, are staff who are, are working in care homes. So that's why it's a, it's a protective thing uh, for residents to test uh, staff, even if they are not symptomatic. So that's the rationale for that particular extension. Do you want to say more? The other thing I, I would add to that is that, as we've said before, th this test is a particularly invasive form of test, taking the swab uh, that involves getting, so getting the sample that you would then test. Many, many of our residents in care homes are elderly, they're frail, many of them uh, suffer from dementia, and the swabbing involved is particularly distressing. So in the absence of symptoms, given that the purpose of this extension is as the First Minister has described, and that is to cut off as many transmission routes into the care home as we possibly can, and given that residents will not have moved out of that care home, then there seemed to be no good clinical or ethical reason for uh, testing residents who are not symptomatic. Should a resident become symptomatic, then of course, uh, that is uh, the steps that we then take. But in those care homes without an active case, then that is our rationale for, for testing the care home workers, as the First Minister says, they know for of their own, but they may be transmitters of the virus into the care home. Uh, but the residents, uh, to leave them not tested unless they show any of the symptoms that we've already described. Thank you. Uh, Tom Gordon from The Herald. Hello there, uh, First Minister. Can I just go right back to the start and the expansion of testing to the general population? Um, now, the advice at the moment, if you have symptoms, is to lock down, self-isolate at home, don't go out at all. So what takes priority? Should people be staying at home in self-isolation or should they be driving to the airport to get one of these tests? Because people might start to wonder whether self-isolation is now becoming contingent upon a positive test. And also, um, what should people do with this information if they do test positive? Because people may understandably be distressed at testing positive. Is it simply for their own information or does it open up perhaps new sort of medical possibilities or contact with the health service? Okay, these are uh, actually very good questions. So we already with certain groups of symptomatic people advise them 
uh, if they want to, to book a test through uh, one of these drive-through or mobile testing. That, that would be uh, one of the essential reasons. Uh, well, right now you isolate completely if you are uh, symptomatic, but that would be one reason uh, and the only reason to leave your home. And the way these testing centres are set up is to take account of the fact that people uh, may be symptomatic. So it's an extension of something that is already there. Uh, right now, if somebody tests negative, then they would no longer have to uh, continue to isolate. But if they test positive, the advice would continue to be, unless their symptoms worsen or are causing them concern, there would be no need to seek medical attention. But if they did uh, have uh, those concerns, they would uh, phone their GP or the NHS 24 uh, and be referred on to one of the, the assessment centres. Um, in terms of where we go with this, so as we move into test trace isolate, of course, the contact tracing uh, part of this, once we've suppressed the virus more than it is just now, uh, will become uh, a part of uh, what happens when somebody uh, tests positive or is reporting with symptoms. Uh, so what we have announced today is an extension of tried and tested systems for some groups that are already in place uh, that are simply being extended to a wider uh, group of the population. Gregor, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I think um, receiving a test is a perfectly legitimate um, reason why people should um, leave their home if they develop any of these three symptoms that we've outlined today. Um, but, but I think it's also important to realise that beyond that, there, there, there are very, there, there are no real other reasons why people should be um, uh, breaking that, that, that self-isolation. So the advice very clearly to people is, yes, you can leave for a test, uh, but, but beyond that, you should self-isolate yourself for seven days and any household members you have for 14 days in case they develop symptoms too. Um, if your symptoms continue beyond seven days, particularly a symptom of fever, um, then you should continue to self-isolate until that's gone. Um, if they continue, then you should also, at that point, um, seek um, kind of some further advice by phoning NHS 24 and 111. And if you feel that your symptoms are worsening during that time, I think that's also another very legitimate reason as to phone NHS 24 on 111 for further advice. Okay, thank you. Uh, Scott McNabb from The Scotsman. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Uh, business leaders appeared before the Economy Committee at the Scottish Parliament this morning and called for a, a clear timeline from the government to be published for a return to um, economic activity and also criticised previous contradictory guidance on which firms could operate and which couldn't. Can I ask, is this part of the work that's been undertaken by the Scottish Government? Will it be part of this route map which you set out on Thursday? Um, firstly, I, I don't accept that the guidance has been contradictory. The guidance has been very clear to businesses. We have uh, consistently said there are businesses that are required by law to close right now, and, and that at this stage hasn't changed. There are businesses that are essential to the running of the country. Um, they have to continue to operate. Uh, and the businesses in the middle, we've given clear guidance about the tests they should be applying to judge uh, whether or not uh, they should be operational or not. And that guidance at this stage hasn't changed. Uh, yes, the return to at work, if you like, the reopening and restarting of the economy will be covered in the route map we set out on uh, Thursday. What I said at the outset, and you know, Scotland will be no different to other countries in this, that we will not be able to put firm dates on all of that because the uh, the phasing has to be driven uh, not by arbitrary dates in a calendar, but by the evidence uh, and the data of how the virus is operating. Uh, but we, as we go through this, will be able to firm up those dates. Uh, what we are saying now, assuming uh, we uh, don't see any evidence between now and then that would change this, is that that first phase will start around the next review date, um, and then we will judge things uh, on a, a, a basis after we have a three weekly review cycle after that, and that will be the basis on which uh, we judge things, although decisions can be taken uh, earlier than that should the, the evidence say that that is necessary. Um, I want the economy to be operational as much as anybody does and as quickly as possible, but it will not be doing the economy any good if we prematurely uh, restart things and allow the virus to run out of control again. We'll end up then in a further lockdown that will do even more and potentially more long-lasting damage to the economy. So we must get these decisions uh, right and we must take them uh, with that overall objective in mind. Andrew Learmans from The National. 
Hi, Prime Minister. Um, there's a Scottish Green amendment to this week's emergency coronavirus bill uh, that would see the birth control pill added to the list of products available to be prescribed in pharmacies under the Minor Ailments Service. Um, there's cross-party support. The, the, the Tories, Labour and Lib Dem have all suggested they'll uh, back it. Um, is it something the Scottish Government are, are minded to support? I certainly have a lot of sympathy uh, with that position. Obviously, there's a lot of amendments that we're working through right now. I know there's another amendment from the Greens on, uh, you know, companies that uh, operate in tax havens not getting support. There are, uh, again, that's a, a, an amendment that we are very uh, supportive of in, in principle, but there are sometimes issues with the, the technicalities and the legalities of amendments. So these discussions are ongoing, and we will obviously set out our position uh, once we've we've come to uh, a conclusion. But on the issue uh, that you uh, talk about, it's certainly a, an issue that I have a lot of uh, sympathy with. Uh, Kieran Andrews from The Times. Thanks, First Minister. There's been quite a lot of personal criticism from politicians of Jason Leach um, over the Scottish Government's strategy towards COVID-19. Just wondered, could you please clarify who's given you advice um, that form the basis for your decisions on policy? How often that advice has led to a substantial change in policy around, for example, testing or mass gatherings? And why do you think Jason Leach is taking so much of the criticism himself? Uh, my advice comes, uh, and I've said this out before, we get advice through the UK SAGE uh, body, through the uh, advisory group that has been established in Scotland, through the chief medical officer, um, and that advice comes uh, in an you know, on different issues almost on a daily basis, and that informs the decisions we take. But ultimately, I'm the decision maker with uh, the Cabinet Secretary and the Cabinet as a whole. Uh, and if anybody has criticisms uh, to make, they should make them of the elected uh, politicians, uh, because we firstly are accountable and obviously are in a better position if we think those criticisms are unfair or uh, not well founded we can answer back in a way that officials and clinicians who remember work for whoever the government of the day is regardless of its uh, party affiliation or, or, or colour and I think there's something really invidious about anybody uh, any politician in particular uh, attacking uh, personally or otherwise an official or a clinician that is there to offer advice. It's the politicians who decide and we should be subjected to scrutiny and where it's justified we should be subjected to criticism. I uh, never have and never will have any issue with that but I do have an issue with people subjecting uh, officials to unfair criticism uh, of that nature. Um, Jason Leach, in my view, does a very uh, good job. He has uh, done an incredibly important job in helping to communicate messages to the public. And I know because I get very many messages from members of the public who appreciate greatly the job that he has done. As we've gone through this uh, virus so far, and this will not stop here, we will no doubt continue to learn more about this virus. Certain things that we thought previously turned out to, to change as we learned more about it. That is in the nature of something uh, like this. Uh, and my last point really is just the general way in which we go about things right now. Uh, scrutiny is really important and essential. And regardless of whether I think that or not, it is a a feature of our democracy. But I think, and I've tried to do this by and large, I think we should just try and keep party politics out of this right now. Uh, scrutiny, yes, but trying to reduce things to political or politicised arguments or constitutional arguments, I don't think serves anybody well. And I will continue to try not to do that and simply focus on what do we need to do to beat this virus. And others, of course, have every right to apply scrutiny to the decisions that I'm taking. And lastly, Charles Fletcher from Caledonia. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Good afternoon. I was going to ask you about the phased relaxation of lockdown, especially in our rural and island community. It's, I rather think you've covered that earlier. In okay. Thank you, uh, Charles. Thank you very much uh, indeed for that. Um, that concludes the questions uh, we have today. Um, thanks to the journalists, my thanks to the Chief Medical Officer and the Health Secretary, uh, to Jill, 
uh, our BSL interpreter for uh, helping us today. And uh, thanks to you, as always, for joining us. Um, please continue to stick to the rules right now, because every day we do that now uh, brings forward the time when we can start that easing that I spoke about earlier on and we'll speak about on in more detail on Thursday of this week. Uh, we will see you again here tomorrow at the usual time of 12.30. Uh, for now, thank you very much.